Well, there was once a time when a police officer was the bastion of the community. People knew who their local Bobby was, and what's more, they trusted them. The role of a police officer is to protect the public and detecting and preventing crime. Policing by consent is the basis of law and order in this country. Unfortunately, the stark reality is the British public no longer has confidence in the police. For the first time in 30 years, more people think the police are doing a bad job than a good one. This was the survey by YouGov that also found only a quarter of people felt officers will be able to catch and prosecute someone if they were burgled. And over a third said it was unlikely a perpetrator would be prosecuted if they were the victim of a sexual assault. It's that bad. Now, it's fair to say the police force have had a right good kicking over the last few years. Rightly or wrongly, some forces have been embroiled in scandal. Five constabularies in England are currently under special measures. But some of this was not the police's doing. Budgets have been cut continuously during the last 14 years of Conservative rule. Around 20,000 officers were cut by the then Home Secretary Theresa May. The Tories, of course, will claim we've hired an extra 20,000 since then, but that was only to replace the ones they'd sacked in the first place. Policing priorities are stretched beyond belief right now, partly down to work of eco-zealots like Just Stop Oil and, of course, the hundreds, sometimes thousands of extra officers being drafted in to help deal with pro-Palestinian demonstrations. And for most people, the reality is this. If you're burgled today, you could be waiting more than a day, two or three in some cases, for someone to come to your house. It's not surprising, then, that the biggest police force in the UK is also the one that's mostly under the spotlight right now. And for all the wrong reasons, Metropolitan Police Chief Sir Mark Rowley has been in the role nearly two years, and in that time he's had to deal with things like the aftermath of the Sarah Everard murder, trying to remove rogue officers with currently a 1,000 suspended or on restricted duties, and deal with a capital city in the grips of a crime wave. And sometimes... It's about optics, things that look really very, very bad indeed, no matter how well-intentioned a police officer might be. For many, this moment was the proverbial icing on the cake. It might have been just one officer's, but perhaps the clearest example of a rotten response. If I could ask you to slow down, please. Thank you very much. I know, I heard you. I don't want to stay here. I want to leave. In that case, sir... When the crowd is gone, I will help you escort you out. No, sir. I don't, I don't want anybody antagonising anybody. Yeah, and at the moment, sir, you are quite openly Jewish. This is a pro Palestinian march. I'm not accusing you of anything, but I'm worried about the reaction to your presence. Openly Jewish. That was Gideon Falter, the chief executive of the campaign against anti-Semitism, a Jewish man being told he's not free to cross the road in London in 2024. It beggars belief. The Prime Minister said he was appalled by the treatment given to Mr Falter. The men have issued two apologies now. The original response caused further outrage. Gideon Falter has said it's time for Sir Mark Rowley to resign. And I would ask Sir Mark Rowley if not being able to walk in the vicinity of these marches as a Jew is not serious disruption to the life of the community, then what on earth is? And if he's so serious about safeguarding the Jewish community, why doesn't he use these powers to ban the marches? And why doesn't he investigate all of the incidents that happened to me on the march instead of just press releasing that he's going to meet with me when apparently he has no intention of doing so? Well, unfortunately for Gideon Falter and others, the Met chief is not going anywhere. Whitehall has made it clear Sir Mark Rowley's job is not under threat. But don't read too much into that. The same thing, of course, was said time and time again about his predecessor, Dame Cressida Dick, and we all know what happened to her. With all of these elements in mind, we're asking this question, do you still have trust in the police? Lines are now open 0344 499 1000, text 8722. Or on the socials at Talk TV with me to discuss this and the rest of the day's big stories. Telegraph columnist and sketch writer Madeline Grant is back with us. Good to see you, Madeline. Good um, me. I mean, it, it doesn't rain, it just pours down like billio for the old bill at the moment, really. <laughs> I mean, there's lots of elements and issues going on. Some of it is, is, is fair game. Um, there are other areas where I think we can all be quite defensive of the police. I don't think they're all rotten no. by any means. We would all still call the police if you're in trouble. And I think 90 or 99% of them are there to do, you know, to catch the bad guys. But of course, the, 
the small number stands out. Uh, the fact that people have lost trust, and this is the first survey where more people don't trust the police than do, should be taken seriously. Absolutely, and I'm surprised that it's taken this long for these findings to be revealed, for there to be a clear majority of people who no longer have faith in the police force, because I feel that this sentiment has been growing for a long time. I think it really took a big hit during lockdown when we saw how very uh, thoughtlessly and insensitively the police were sometimes policing. And as you say, it's not always the fault of the police that often they've been given ever-changing um, and very hard to decipher laws in, to implement from the government in the first place. But nevertheless, that, that seriously d hasn't helped. And of course, the fallout from these Palesti Palestine protests. But I think more broadly, there's just very clear data that certain crimes that they would call lower level crime or mm. even sort of medium level crime has essentially been decriminalized. You know, that that vast, vast majority of burglaries are not being solved, shoplifting is rife, and people can really see it. it I think it, it kind of erodes at the social contract if you live in a place where there is constant shoplifting. It's, it's very visible, you know, mm. and it, it leads into this sense that we're in a kind of increasingly ungoverned country. Um, and I think the police, if their strategy has been to focus more on what they consider to be the higher level crimes, I think they really should reconsider what it does to people if, you know, things, things get nicked and nothing happens. Yeah. Your phone gets, gets stolen and want, yes. you receive a Weasley message saying, we've looked into it, sorry, nothing more we There's can do. We can Even do. if you say to them, I have found my iPhone and I can tell you exactly where my phone currently is, they still say no, that, sorry. You see, that's where it becomes tricky. Yeah. So, a uh, couple of days ago, Saturday, Friday night, one of my neighbours was burgled and quite a lot of stuff was taken mm. and it was, it was fairly audacious stuff, but it was, you know, it was dark and they, they picked the house that was kind of where the back was out of the way, there was nothing overlooking the house. Yeah. Um, and I happened to just put... The, and they were away for the night, and I just happened to pull up and I bumped into them. Don't, don't, they'd not been there that long, I don't know them that well, but they said, oh, did you see anything? We've been... But we're waiting for the police now. And then the husband said, oh, well, we're not hopeful the police are going to turn up. But actually, they did show up. They yeah. showed up within about an hour. Yeah. And they had a forensics team, and they dusted it down for the fingerprints. They realised the place had been sprayed with Dettol, which... Are, apparently is a way of getting rid of some of your DNA. Really? Something like that. Yeah. And then this morning I noticed when I came out, there was a police car outside the house, so they're obviously paying another visit. Um, I don't know this is, if this is under the banner of... I mean, we, could, we shouldn't be surprised at this. We're talking about somebody whose house I know, has been burgled. And I'm telling an anecdote about, about... Guess what happened? The police yeah, showed up. You know, but that's how it should be, but for so poverty, long it wasn't like It's that. such poverty of low expectations, because when yes. I, I heard that story, my first thought was, oh, good, maybe they're beginning to turn things around, and it's like, this is not what turning it True. around ought to look like. Exactly. You know, basic policing for... British taxpayers who have a right to have their private property defended, which is one of Correct. the core functions of government. But um, on that on, on that night, apparently there were two other burglaries, and the police, just by the way it happened, they know it was probably the same people. They've established they're clearly professional thieves by the way they did things. Yeah. Um, now, I don't know what the police are meant to do in terms of finding those people. How much... It's only now we're forced to think about this. How yeah. many... How many coppers... Do you, what are the chances of them being found? How many coppers do you allocate to just one town and three burglaries? Is yeah. it two coppers? Is it 22 coppers? I don't That's know. That's a good question. And if you took 22 coppers off the beat to concentrate on that, what are the chances of a success? And what happens to other areas that then become neglected? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think it really depends what it is. I mean, if you're dealing with a very well-organised gang, that's one thing. But often there are forms of robbery that take place and it doesn't seem to have that level of organisation at all. Mm. When I was at university, a big thing was people's bikes getting stolen. It was almost good not On campus, good to have or... a terrible bike because it was less likely to get nicked. So I yeah. got one that was so bad that it didn't have proper brakes, but at least mine didn't get nicked. No pedals. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but um, they, it was very common for people to be able to track down their bike just by going on eBay, or not eBay, but going to, like, the local sellers and yes. just doing that. I mean, you think that if people can be vigilantes and track down their yeah. own stuff, then so could... Oh, we, we've had, just to compound your point, <laughs> we've had so many calls from, from fantastic listeners and viewers who've, who've said, it wasn't that, you know, my, my cloud was able to tell me where my phone was. I, I've actually got CCTV footage of the person stealing yes. my car, yes. robbing my house, 
My neighbour down the road has got further footage of the car going out and the high street must have footage of the car driving down. Yeah. And none of this was investigated. It's that, it's that it's, area it's, that exactly, really That's right. And people, people have started to really invest in this kind of technology because they don't trust the police. Another sign that people don't trust the police is that yep. many shops are now hiring more and more security guards because they have to do it themselves. True. But I think that what you get with the police force, as with the NHS, another good example of this, often it's a bit of a postcode lottery. Some forces mm -hmm. clearly work much better than others, and some are unfit for purpose. I mean, we hear so much about the Met Police, but there are other forces in special measures too. So I think you end True. up with a situation that's very like non-uniform in terms of mm. what your chance of you know law and justice ever being served looks in, like. Indeed, what's your take on... I mean, there's a lot of women, we're told, don't trust the police. I mean, the Sarah Everard oh, yeah. story kind of sort of really did inflame this um, ho horrific reality that some women, if they were the victim, would not feel comfortable calling the police. As, as a woman, do you, do you recognise that? Well, I mean, I, I think every woman will take a, a different view on this. They will have a different, different experiences, different mm. interactions if they've ever had to deal with the police. I must say that I once had to go to the police with something that was worried about what was to do with my own personal security, and they actually were really... They were fantastic about it. So I, I was really surprised and um, heartened by what I saw, but, of course, that's just one person's experience. And I think that the, what happened with the, the policing of that protest, um, that came after so many protests had been al basically allowed to go ahead by the police, you know, so that it was very... It, there was that sense yeah. of two-tier policing. You know, if you're protesting Black Lives Matter, you go for it, you can do whatever you like. Uh, if you're protesting lockdown or you're protesting the murder of a young woman by a serving police officer, then we will treat you very differently. So from yeah, the, yeah. the, you know, it's taken such a reputational hit. But this, this, totally. this question of Mark Rowley and whether he should stay, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't really see what that would achieve. I think all that would do is the taxpayer would be liable for a big payoff fee for Mark Rowley Correct. and then we'd get somebody else in. I don't think we... we and then the whole thing start all over again. You've got to deal with yeah, it yeah. from top to bottom. Yeah, true. I mean, I think Peter Hitchens maybe has a point when he says you've got to basically de decommission the Met and just build it a fresh one from, yeah. from, from, from the ground up. But it's with. arguably too big as well. I mean, it's yeah. such a huge... I think it's the biggest police force in Western Europe. It, it's massive. So yeah. maybe there's something in that.